the general message out to our patients who are suffering and are degraded by their suffering, that um, the problem sits in their brains yeah. and that their brains did what they would have to do Absolutely. is life altering. Mm -hmm. And I can't imagine how you run, how differently you would run an inpatient unit if you know that as opposed to whatever mm -hmm. is current now. So are we. <laughs> My personal story is not the significance of this conversation. It fills in around the edges because it gives a context. Mm -hmm. But it's uh, a million personal stories that we're trying to understand mm -hmm. through the way brains are different with people who have had these kinds of experiences, these kinds of childhoods, to differ uh, as opposed to those who have not. Mm -hmm. Right? Absolutely. So I am both a clinician and I have been someone who has had these experiences and have, if the word is even adequate, recovered from them with an enormous amount of therapeutic help. And the therapeutic help has been uh, psychodynamic psychotherapy. It has been uh, body work that is trauma-focused on primarily on the fascial layer, I think, of experience. Mm -hmm. um, and it has been with training my brain uh, with the use of neurofeedback. So when we were talking last night, one of the things that we agree on, agree on many things, but one of the things we agree on is that the problem is first and foremost in the brain and want to think about the, the possibility, the likelihood that this is the inevitable brain for somebody who is under threat from the time they are very little, when they are defenseless. Under threat either in the absence of the parent or the parents or the caretakers and the absence of, and in the presence of predation the presence of threat or the, uh, the threat to their lives in, in one or multiple ways. A young child under these circumstances, the brain patterns that you are seeing are not pathological. They are in alignment with the reality of the circumstances that this brain was developing within. You and I are having this conversation to try to illuminate what the brain structures are, your main contrib major contribution, if it made many, but your major contribution and ongoing contribution is to try to see what's going on in the brain for people that have had these histories. Those are the systems that you're going to be taking us through in conversation today. And my part of this conversation is to try to put, as it were, meat on the bones of the research to say, this is what that experience felt like as much as we can pinpoint it to the vestibular or the interoception or the, you know, whatever these different systems are that you are identifying. Mm -hmm. So I, you know, I just wanted to make sure that we had that clearly stated and just want to know if you have any, any, any thoughts on that. No, I completely agree uh, with this phrase that the brain, and I would add the body to that, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and the mind align with the reality it's forced into. Mm -hmm. And to be able to do that, I think the brain, mind, and body are incredibly creative and incredibly challenged. And I think it's amazing to see how somebody can actually adapt to such a dark reality often and survive. Yeah. Right? Which I think is incredible. Surviving and even in some cases, almost in a separate reality, thrive. That's right. Often altered states of consciousness help us to survive. Right? 
if being in the present is not tolerable, then we have to create an altered state that helps us to survive when the present is not tolerable. As Alan Shore or Frank Putnam has said, a psychological escape when no physical escape is possible, right? To escape into an altered state. Well, right, but I think that brings us back into a kind of agency that I'm questioning because who who at my four month old baby, who was making a decision about exiting the reality? Mm -hmm. My brain, body, reality was fixed by the situation in which it found itself. Mm -hmm. So this, the question of the psychological defenses is really part of our conversation at least for me. I mean, I've always wondered who is it in childhood trauma, I'm not talking about adult trauma, but who, and even there it might be a question to me, but in childhood trauma, where is agency even forming to make these kinds of decisions that are assumed in that literature? And the use of the word decision, I think is interesting because is it a conscious decision? I, my hypothesis is that it isn't. I think that uh, a lot of this is subconsciously driven, you know, through the reptilian brain that's so responsible for innate and reflexive responding. Mm -hmm. right? mm -hmm. This is not something you think about, right. right? This is something that I think through those innate reflexive responses, the brain is, can be driven into through a bottom-up approach. That I agree with completely. Mm -hmm. But then it isn't in a sense like trying to imagine a iguana having a psychological process. Right? Mm -hmm. And I, I mean, I know that it's a whole complex. I'm not mm -hmm. suggesting that. But mm -hmm. I'm saying this is so driven by bottom-up experiences. Mm -hmm. It is so driven by some way that the fascia encodes the threat mm -hmm. or the assault or the actual assault or the actual absence. I mean, I think it codes the absence as well, not just the threat. Mm -hmm. And right. doesn't the psychology come out of brain and body? Yes. And I think there's psychological processes at different levels, right? At conscious and at con subconscious levels or at explicit or implicit levels. How about non-conscious levels? Which is really what the reptilian brain yeah. would have to be. It's not, this is pre-relationship, this is pre-cognition, obviously, it's mm -hmm. pre-choice. And, and if you are stuck in this circuitry mm -hmm. of threat and fear and reactivity, mm -hmm. that is going, it would have to form the way that you see the world. Absolutely. And we have studies that show that uh, the reptilian brain very much affects higher brain functioning mm -hmm. and cognition. Mm -hmm. right? It is the foundation, right? And just like the foundation of a house affects the rest of the house, the foundation of the brain, which is the reptilian brain, affects both the upper layers of the brain but also the body, right? It's really the intersection actually between brain and body. Very few of our clinical colleagues anyway, and maybe also in research, but very few people clinically working with trauma are focused at all on these mechanisms in the brain or how to address them. And that we have to, we have to know what's going on in the brain in the brains uh, collectively of this group of people. There are obviously all kinds of idiosyncratic manifestations, but they can be understood from these patterns of connectivity or Absolutely. disconnection, right? Treatment then requires going into the infrastructure of mind and to a certain extent body, and, and how can we work with those? And in my experience, personally, what I have 
found was that I would work and work and work and work in therapy to, in, I didn't have the language for it at that time, but to help my mind regulate my brain. Mm -hmm. That direction is at best arduous. Can you give an example of how you used your mind to regulate your brain? Well, Sorry. that's to me what all of psychodynamic therapy is. Mm -hmm. You just try to understand, have more insight into mm -hmm. your mm -hmm. childhood, mm -hmm. know what your, and that can be very important. It's not like I'm mm -hmm. saying that, you know, let's mm -hmm. throw this baby out with the bathwater. Mm -hmm. It's not that at all. Mm -hmm. It is that it, if the, if the brain itself has been, has formulated the mind that we are now mm -hmm. describing, um, the brain as the person sitting in front of you, not the history of childhood, mm -hmm. but the brain that is still firing and those patterns that were developed then, and that's the person that's sitting. And so I would try, all the premise of psychotherapy is that you know, we have to be reaching the brain or psychotherapy wouldn't work. Mm -hmm. When I have been able to train my brain to regulate itself mm -hmm. through feedback, I can then quiet the mind. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't keep doing these mm -hmm. flares or these dissociative sucks or the, you know, mm -hmm. this sort of pull. It doesn't happen anymore. Mm -hmm. It just stops. Over time, it doesn't mm -hmm. happen immediately. It has mm -hmm. to learn a new pattern of response to stimuli. Mm -hmm. The brain is the it there. But trying to get to those mechanisms, which are there, and you're seeing them every time you look at somebody, That's you're seeing them. So to get to those mechanisms through the process of examining the mind and the history and the, even the body, mm -hmm. the body, in my experience, just does not cooperate with this process of questioning. It requires that we have our hands on somebody has their informed and and brilliant hands on the traumatized body. But that can go haywire too. And it has to be very carefully done because you have the same kind of, of fear reactivity sitting in the, in the muscle or in the fascia in the connective tissue mm -hmm. that you have hidden in some pattern in the brain that we call a trigger. Mm -hmm. What we're also seeing is the brain and the body are very disconnected. So you often lose that top-down brain regulation of the body, right? So it's bringing those two pieces back together. Yeah, it's hard to even imagine if I think about my own history and, and try to sort of imagine that in a circuitry psychophysiology way, mm -hmm. I can't, I can't mm -hmm. find it. Mm -hmm. You know, I can't represent it in my internal state at all. I don't know what, I don't know what top-down regulation of the body would even, would feel like or look like. Mm -hmm. Well, for example, there's a network called the central autonomic network in the brain that regulates you know, heart rate variability and other autonomic functions. And in people who haven't had a trauma history, that central autonomic network function in the brain is very much connected to heart rate variability, for example, mm -hmm. which is, of course, a big predictor of emotion regulation. Mm -hmm. And in traumatized individuals, we find that there's no relationship between functioning really? of the central yeah. autonomic network and heart rate variability. And so I think part of treatment is really reconnecting brain and body so, you know, the brain can start regulating the body again in an adaptive way. Because that's a lot of the work that they're doing with teaching people how to regulate their hearts, right, through feedback. Absolutely. Right, yeah. as opposed to how did your mother treat you Yeah. as, a, as, as the conversation. Yeah. Right, yeah. I just wanted to, to sort of set the chapter heading, as it were, you know, of what, why we're even here, so that people can start to, to think more deeply, use the neuroscience, mm -hmm. think more deeply about how, be, begin to, to put to aside theories of mind, at least theories of mind that don't arise from these 
very patterns that you identify over and over again. Absolutely. All right, so maybe it's time to talk about the brain. Okay, there you go. Thank <laughs> you.